Good evening, class. I hope you're having a blessed day today. Today we are in topic number nine. We're dealing with the abomination of desolation. Uh, this is probably the most important lesson of the entire curriculum. I don't know. I say that just about every week because the beauty of Christ was an amazing lesson. Seven churches of the book of the Revelation. That's amazing. But now we're in topic number nine and we're dealing with the abomination of desolation. To, to let you know kind of the outline of the next three weeks, this is what it looks like. We're going to talk about the abomination of desolation. Then we're going to talk about the harlot Babylon. And then we're going to talk about biblical signs of the times. And you might say, well, why are those three the specific things that we added into this end times curriculum? Because as you know, when we did our, uh, our perspective and purpose from the beginning, we want to see Jesus more clearly when we study end times. Well, I want to go ahead and let you know that we are working backwards. And you might say, what do you mean? If you were to look at a timetable of all of human history, and the very end is the Lord, is the very end, the, the glory of the Father dwelling with men on the earth. Back up before there, the millennial reign of the man Christ Jesus, when Jesus reigns for a thousand years. Before that is the uh, when Jesus throws the Antichrist into the lake of fire and binds the devil in prison for that thousand years. Before Jesus comes back and the battle for Jerusalem takes place. Now, what I want you to know is that if you look at the return of Jesus, the minute Jesus is, the day that Jesus is coming down and coming back to the earth, a lot of people say, well, you don't know the day or the hour. Correct. In, in, the, in the scope of life, in the scope of eternity, you do not know the exact day that Jesus is coming back until one thing happens. When the abomination of desolation takes place, the reason why we declare it as the number one biblical sign of the time is because when you see that take place, three and a half years later, Jesus is coming back. And we're going to explain this as we go through the lesson. So I'm not going to explain it just yet. But that's why it's number one. Before the abomination is the harlot Babylon. That's what we're going to talk about next week. Before the harlot are all of the other biblical signs of the times. So you have all of these signs. And the reason why we call them signs is like signposts. If you're in Tennessee and you're traveling to Florida down I-75, there's billboards. You know, Florida, 300 miles, Florida, 200 miles, Florida, 100 miles. And it's counting it down until you get there. Those are what we call signs. But there is, uh, there are signs that are of, you know, great importance, lesser of importance, but there is a, the greatest sign is the abomination of desolation. So we're going to work our way backwards. Jesus returns, we're going back three and a half years to the abomination of desolation. Then we'll go back another step and we'll talk about the harlot, which foreruns the abominations before it. And then we'll go back for that. So we're working our way back in history to where we are at today. So we're going to start at the Lord Jesus' return and we're going to work our way back three and a half years. And that's what we're going to talk about today, which is called the abomination of desolation. Now, when we talk about biblical end times, there's a lot of things that people don't understand or don't know. And there are certain phrases and terms that we use. One is the abomination of desolation. And I say that phrase a lot, especially around church people. And they have no understanding on what we're talking about. So the very first section we're going to look at is going to explain why this lesson is so important. This is also, I believe, our most watched teaching on our entire YouTube channel was the abomination of desolation and we taught it last quarter. I thought about just copying and pasting over and letting you hear what we taught before, but I actually feel like teaching it again because I want to be blessed by it. So I do also want you to know, as you can tell, we have a different background. We have left Chicago. We left Chicago yesterday. We are now uh, in a transition, what I call a staging period as we get ready to go to Brazil. Remember, all of our curriculums will continue. We'll continue to uh, put out all of the information as we go. So whether we, no matter where we are at, we are going to continue to teach the Word of God. So just understand that. Don't think we're going to stop because 
The will of God never stops no matter where we are at. So we are going to jump in to the abomination of desolation. We're on page 24 of your curriculum, and uh, we're at topic number nine. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to jump right into it. So Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let the word become wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of your son. Spiritual seed sown, producing in our body, mind, will, and emotion, transforming us by the renewing of our mind, conforming us to the image of Christ, growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Page number 24. Let's go ahead and read this first section. Wherefore, when, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, Spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall the coming so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Now, if you know, Matthew 24 and 25 is Jesus' greatest teaching on biblical end times. It's also harmonied in Mark and in Luke. And we're going to look at those examples in just a second. But let's answer some of these questions. What prophet did Jesus reference when talking about the abomination of desolation? He was referencing the prophet Daniel, spoken of by the prophet, or spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Now this is important. Jesus only referenced one Old Testament prophet when he spoke of the end times. So that should, one, should show you the importance of, of what Daniel spoke about. And we're going to look at the examples out of the book of Daniel. And if you are following our daily teachings, we're actually studying the last six chapters, Daniel 7 and 12. We're studying all of those chapters. So I would encourage you to follow our daily teachings where you can get even more information on that. But where does the abomination occur? It says, stand in the holy place. Now that's important because the holy place is talking about the temple in Jerusalem. Well, that's really important because there is no temple in Jerusalem right now. So this is where we start to really understand biblical signs of the times and really start to understand when Jesus is coming back. And people say, well, what do you mean? Well, a lot of times, people get so wrapped up in the culture, and everybody wants to be a prophet, and everybody wants to say when it's going to take place, yet nobody can, can explain biblically what the biblical narrative is when it comes to the end times. It says that Jesus will come back after the abomination of desolation. We're going to see this over and over. Even Jesus, in his own mouth. If they say there's Christ, believe it not. So Jesus is not coming back until after the abomination takes place. That's important to understand because even the very elect of God could be deceived. Now I tell people that all the time. And I'll give you a really great example next week when we talk about the harlot Babylon. 
But I want you to understand that if you do not study the biblical narrative dealing with end times, you are so more susceptible to being deceived. And we know that deceit leads to or deception leads to offense, which leads to people falling away from the body of Christ. The great falling away takes place because of offense that came from deception. That's why we must study the end time narrative. But it stands in the holy place. In Jerusalem. Now for thousands of years, some of these passages didn't make sense because Israel wasn't even a nation. But it was in 1949, I believe, where Israel became a nation. And that's, and that's part of it, now that they're a nation. And then they got control of Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem. But there is no temple built yet. So the Antichrist can't walk into the temple if there is no temple. We're going to talk about this as we go to finish the lesson when we summarize it at the end, that there are three main biblical signs of the times that must take place before the abomination can occur. And that's important because when we see those signs come to place, we know that the stage is being set. Right now, the, the, the Lord in all of these signs, he's setting the stage for big events to take place. But I want you to know, these events have not taken place yet. Do not let somebody deceive you. It's not done. We're not there yet. This is the biblical narrative. And this is even, not even studying Daniel first. I want to first study what did Jesus say. I'm not coming back until after this is done. But it stands in the holy place. Now, what are the people in the geographic area told to do when this happens? Flee right then. Don't even take anything. Just run. Don't even go into your house to get a coat. Run right then. Because when the Antichrist commits the abomination of desolation, which we'll see all of it as we go to finish the lesson, when that takes place, what will happen in that moment is he will pull his mask off. He will show himself to be a beast. And he will come after the nation of Israel to kill every single one of them. He is going to try to wipe out the entire nation of Israel from off the planet. Every Jew, he's coming to kill you. And not only just the Jew, but every believer that stands for truth and stands for Jesus, the Antichrist will be coming to kill you. So if you're in that city, run. Don't wait. Flee immediately. Just take off. Because when the Antichrist does that, he's coming to kill you right then. There will be no hesitation. There will be no reasoning. There will be no restraint. He will rage as a beast to make this happen. So that's why you need to understand Jesus said when he said run, he means actually physically run. Get out right then. Because it's about to be a very dangerous time to stand for Jesus and live in that city. But what happens immediately after the abomination of desolation? Trouble as has never been since the beginning of the world. The great tribulation at that moment has started. Time was shortened. Otherwise, no flesh would be saved. Now, when it says no flesh would be saved, it doesn't mean no flesh would be saved, meaning there won't be any believers. It's meaning no flesh will be saved in the way that nobody will be alive. If we study through the book of Revelation, which I encourage you to take part two, this is part one, if you take part two, we're going to go verse by verse through the entire book of Revelation. And I encourage you to take that class because if you read through the book of the Revelation, the rage of the Antichrist and, and the mass murder and genocide and, and violence that would be taking place as he rages and comes against the nations, and the nations that try to resist him, and he overthrows them and kills them, and, and, and the widespread desolation of the Antichrist's rage, along with the, gut, with the judgments of God against the Antichrist, will cause widespread desolation to the point that if it wasn't shortened, there would nobody be left alive. Everybody would be dead. That's what it's talking about. It's not saying people wouldn't be saved. It's saying people would be, literally nobody would be alive if they didn't shorten the time. That's important because if you understand what Adolf Hitler did in the years that he did it, I mean, Adolf Hitler was in power uh, quite a lot longer than uh, three and a half years. I mean, 
Think about Joseph Stalin. What was it, 30, 40, 50 years that Joseph Stalin was in Russia? And, 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 and what's so important about that is when trouble happens in the land and people are praying for the reprieve, praying for the deliverance, and it doesn't come. You know, maybe you stand faithful one year, two years, three years, but five, ten years down the line, a lot of people start to lose hope. And whether God really hears them and answers them, well, that type of trouble is going to be so far greater. Imagine Adolf Hitler times a million. That's what the Antichrist is going to do. And that is why the people of God need to understand the time is shortened. We're going to see it in a minute, I believe, where an angel raises his hand and swears by God it will go no longer than three and a half years. So you just remain faithful. Three and a half years is the only time allotted by God that the Antichrist can be on the world scene after the abomination takes place. I've heard people talk about time being short and like there's 24 hours in a day and then there's going to be 12. No, (laughs) wrong understanding. It's not, it's not talking about time as, you know, the hours on the clock are going to change. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the fact that it is ordained by God how long it can last. That's what it's talking about. But what is the main emphasis of Jesus on this time period? This is what I want you to focus on. Deception will be at an all-time high. Do not be deceived. When we study the prophets in the Old Testament, and then we study Jesus, and we're going to look at Paul, and who else are we going to We're going to read Paul, and we're going to read John. When we look at these people in the Bible, they always emphasize one main thing, or two main things. The first one is seduction, the, the lust and the temptation of sin. And the other one that they emphasize more than anything else is being deceived. And we always tell people all the time, the way you are deceived is what you don't know. What you don't know will kill you. You need to be people of understanding. So this is uh, super powerful. Let's keep going. So the very first part we see is that the abomination takes place in the holy place. And it stands. What that is talking about is an image. We're going to explain that some more. But let's read the next one. When you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand. Then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains and let him that is on the housetop not go down into the house, neither enter therein to take anything out of his house and let him that is in the field not turn back again for to take up his garment. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. And pray ye that your flight be not in the winter. For in those days shall be affliction, such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time. Neither shall be. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he has shortened those days. And then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. For false Christ and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. But take heed, behold, I have foretold you all things. Now what additional details do we see from Mark's account? Because remember, the Bible has four Gospels. And there's what we call a harmony, whether whether Matthew says something, Mark says something, Luke says something, John says something, and maybe they say the same story. And if they do, that's what we call a harmony. And maybe one person has details that the other person doesn't, and they emphasize different points. So Matthew and Mark, this is the same harmony. But it says tribulation like none other, and also affliction like none other. That's important because tribulation is a focus on circumstances. You know, what's going on, the things around you. Whereas affliction is focused mainly on the persecution side of it. 
But we see this focus of the Lord to sustain his people and to protect them in the midst of this great tribulation. I told you all these things ahead of time. I did not leave you uninformed. But it where's, where's the abomination of desolation? In the holy place, standing where it ought not. It's talking about the holy place. We'll talk about that more. I love the fact that it says, let him that readeth understand. Like, a lot of times people read these and they go, okay, good to know, and flip. Flip the page and don't stay. No, you need to understand. You need to grasp what it's saying here. It's not too hard. You know, the biblical narrative dealing with the end times is not too hard to grasp. You know, people are like, faith, easy. Prosperity, easy. Healing, easy. You know, some of these things are easy. Well, guess what? The end times is easy also. I was like a lot of people that, the devil wants to keep this book closed. He doesn't want people to understand the biblical narrative so that it's easy to be seduced. It's easy to be deceived. But when I study it and the more I read it, the more I realize it's easy to understand. It's not too hard. Let's read the next one. But when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst depart in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto, for these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That's some very powerful statements that Luke adds in. Now let's talk about this harmony. We see Luke not mention the abomination of desolation. Now he doesn't say it explicitly. But what he does say is all of the circumstances surrounding it. He adds in some details of the circumstances that are taking place. It's important to note this passage because we see what is going to happen to Jerusalem when the abomination takes place. So whereas Matthew and Mark focus specific on a detail of the abomination, Luke adds in the circumstantial or the, the, the circumstances surrounding it. And just to talk about these, Jerusalem compassed with armies, you know, and that's that's an important part because the, the, the Antichrist will have his armies in Jerusalem when he goes to commit the abomination of desolation. But then also it says, these are the days of vengeance. Now you might say, what, do you, what does it mean days of vengeance? It's not talking about the vengeance of the Antichrist. No, vengeance is a recompense of something that has already been done. If you want to go and watch, we have some daily teachings on the vengeance of the Lord. And this days of vengeance is referring to God's days of vengeance where God will judge the world. And God will judge the Antichrist kingdom. That's why it's the great tribulation. The, the judgments of God in the book of the Revelation, the great tribulation, judge, the judgments taking place at the end of the age are not against the people of God. They're against the Antichrist and all ungodliness. It's not against the people of God. I love it. And it, it says to them that are with child that give suck in those days. And what that's talking about is because they're going to be on the run. You know, you're going to have to run and flee from this. And it's just like, it's going to be, it's going to be a challenge. You're going to need supernatural provision and things from God to be able to be sustained because it's going to be, you're going to be running for your life. And it, obviously it's easier to run if you're by yourself. It's harder to run with kids. <laughs> that's, a pretty simple thing to say. But I like how it says great distress in the land. And that's something you need to understand because when it talks about the land, it's not talking about the people. I mean, the very next word is wrath upon people. Distress in the land is legit distress in the land. Whereas God will start judging the world. Water turns to blood, fire coming down from heaven, 100, 100 pound hailstones. I mean, that's what it's talking about against the land. But it does say that people will die by the edge of the sword, and be led captive. That's important to know. Persecution and martyrdom will rise to a level never before seen in history. 
And, the, and Jerusalem being trodden down the time of the Gentiles. That's talking about the time of the abomination of desolation. Now, we're going to read into Daniel. Let's read... How many? Let's read 8 and 9, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll finish up the lesson. So let's, let's read a little bit more. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south, and toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And a host was given unto him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. And it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto a certain saint, which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, who is the little horn? Now, we could study all of Daniel 7 to 12. We're just looking at specific points where the abomination is referenced. Now, like I said, we're going in our daily teachings and our Sunday services, going to go through all six chapters in a whole lot more detail. So if you want more on the passages out of Daniel, then you can watch our daily teachings on it. But the little horn is the Antichrist. That's, what it, that's who the little horn is. But who did the little horn oppose and go against? The prince of princes. The Antichrist is opposing Jesus. You know, there's certain people that say, oh, that's, no, that, that's a metaphor. That's a, that's a poem. No, the Antichrist will wage war against Jesus. That's who he's waging war against. But what was taking away? Listen, the daily sacrifice, which means the Jews have to be operating in the daily sacrifice. Now, in the Old Testament, when Daniel talks about the abomination of desolation, he talks mostly about the daily sacrifice being taken away. That's the type of things that Daniel talked about, is, is, the, is the daily sacrifice. Whereas in the New Testament, it talks about the image of the beast and the mark of the beast. And we're going to talk about all of it. But I just want you to see there's different emphasis on each one. Now, Daniel was a Jewish prophet, you know, in the nation, in the, in the southern kingdom of uh, Judah. So Daniel, and of course, he was taken captive into Babylon and all of that. I don't want to go into all the historical account of Daniel. But Daniel was a, was a, was a Jewish prophet prophesying in the Old Testament of the temple. Whereas in the New Testament, the Apostle John is seeing it from a different point of view, though he is still a Jew, he's seeing the actual New Jerusalem temple. And now, this is important when we say that because they see two different perspectives, but we need to see the entire scope of the picture. So Daniel talks about the daily sacrifice, but he also talks about the Antichrist will use military force, that's what the host is, to stop the sacrifice. So, we've talked about, I said there's three main things that have to be in place before the abomination. So remember, stand in the holy place, which means there has to be a temple. That's number one. Number two is what we see here in Daniel, the Antichrist stops the daily sacrifice. And that right there means that there has to be daily sacrifice. We're talking about actual killing of animals, the daily sacrifice by the priest. So there has to be a temple and there has to be daily sacrifices in the temple. Neither one of those things are taking place just yet. But what is the term that Daniel uses to describe the event? He calls it the transgression of desolation. It's a transgression of desolation, abomination of desolation. We're talking about the same thing. We just call it what Jesus called it, which was the abomination. Because what he does is abominable to God. And we're going to overview it at the very end too. So if you're like, hey, we're going over a lot of stuff. Don't worry. We're going to overview this for, for a few minutes and make it make real. We're going to make it really clear. 
Listen again. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy hill to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Therefore, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Man, I, I really wish we could read all six chapters of the end of Daniel and really talk about this because we're taking just short snippets out of it. But the, the prophet Daniel has a lot of teaching we could go through. But how long is the covenant confirmed for when it is broken? One week. Now, a week in the Old Testament could be a week of days or a week of years. This is obviously referring to years we're going to see more of that later. And like I said, if you want more on Daniel, you'll just have to watch our daily teachings because we can't go all the way through that today. But the Antichrist confirms a covenant for seven years and then it's broken halfway through. He confirms a covenant for one week and then in the midst of the week or halfway through, then uh, he will do the abomination of desolation. So this is where we start to get the timetable. People say there's the tribulation, three and a half years, or seven years. And then they call the last three and a half years the great tribulation. Well, when that three and a half year mark hits, that will be the point in which the, abomin the Antichrist commits the abomination of desolation. If you still don't understand it fully, just hang on. I'm going to explain it all at the very end. I just want to read all the passages and give you all the information. What happens when the covenant is broken? The sacrifices will be ceased. Remember, Daniel focuses really heavy on the sacrifices being stopped. The abominations he, the Antichrist, will do will cause widespread desolation. When the Antichrist commits this abominable deed, and one aspect of the abomination is the stopping of the sacrifice, the other aspect is the putting up of his image. We'll talk about that more in a minute. When he commits this, it will cause widespread desolation. Remember, desolation is two ways. The Antichrist is rage, him killing people, persecuting, destroying things, and then God's judgments against the Antichrist will cause widespread desolation across the whole world. Okay, so we've got two more passages in Daniel, and then we're going to read one from Paul and one from John. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick break. You have one minute, and then when we come back, we will finish the lesson, and then we'll overview the entire lesson. So you got one minute. Let's uh let's get ready. Let's finish the lesson. 
So we're in Daniel 11 now. At the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south. But it shall not be as the former or as the latter. For the ships of Chittim shall come against him, and therefore he shall be greed and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice. And they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Yet they shall fall by the sword and by, and by flame, by captivity, and by spoil many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be hopeless with a little help. But many shall cleave to them with flatteries, and some of them of understanding shall fall, to try them, and to purge, and to make them white, even to the time of the end. Because it is yet for an appointed time, and the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself, and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. For he shall magnify himself above all, but in his estate he shall honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many, and he shall divide the land for gain. Now what does the Antichrist do to cause the abomination of desolation? He causes the sacrifices to be seized. We've said that over and over. He breaks the covenant. We saw that, you know, we saw that, you know, he breaks the covenant one weekend. This time he breaks the holy covenant. He pollutes the sanctuary of strength. Well, how does he pollute it? He places the abomination of desolation in the temple. So remember, daily sacrifices are ceased and he places something in the temple. Now, what other events occur? The Antichrist will be persecuting and, any, and killing anyone who does not worship them. Those with understanding will instruct many. The purification of the church. Listen, a lot of people straddle the fence. But there is no straddling the fence at the face of death. When they take that AK-47 and put that gum barrel to your head and they say, uh, you know, you either... Denounce God or you die right here. There's no straddling. You have to make a choice. And that's what martyrdom does. And that's what martyrdom does in the church when those of understanding fall. It doesn't mean that they fall away from the faith. It means that they're killed. It means like if I understand the biblical narrative and the people around me do and don't, they're kind of a mixed bag. And they come into my church and they put that gun barrel on my head and they say, denounce or I'm going to kill you. And I remain faithful and I die a martyr standing for the truth of it. It purifies the church because it will make a stark line. You're either all in and you're willing to die for it, even unto death, or you're not in at all and you will denounce. And that's what martyrdom does. It creates the reality and the environment where love will be able to be displayed at the deepest level of the heart. There's no greater demonstration of love than to die for it. That's what's called martyrdom. We'll talk about that more later. But some will be delivered. And you say, well, who will be delivered? Well, I don't want to go into this today, and I pray that you've taken our BSM discipleship curriculum because you would have already known this. But just as a quick reminder, Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down willfully. And Paul said, I ran the race, I finished my course, now I'm willing to be offered, I'm willing to give myself up. The people that receive help are the people that ask for it and receive it by faith. 
Because not everybody that's in trouble will call for help. And, and you, you might say, well, what does that mean? Well, Paul could have got out of the chains when he was with the Roman guard. I mean, he was delivered when he was in the cell with Paul. Paul and Silas pray worship. The entire prison opens up. Everybody's chains fall off, yet nobody moves. This is what the reality of people of strong faith can do. I can, if I have finished, I'll, I'll speak for me. If I have finished my course and I've done everything God needs me to do, and they say, we're going to kill you, I'm not going to call on a legion to deliver me. Because if I'm done and it's time to be with the Lord, I will give my life freely. I'll do it willfully. I won't, I won't have to call on it. But if I'm not done or if I need deliverance, then I call deliverance and angels will come and deliver me. That's, that's the truth of people of strong faith. People say, well, some people get it, some people don't, and you never know. No, you do know. That's what the biblical narrative is. If you make your life look like Jesus, you decide when you die. They tried to throw Jesus off a cliff, and Jesus said, nope, walked right through him. He went to the cross, and it's like, oh, take yourself down. He's like, I could call a legion of angels to deliver me. Yet I'm giving my life freely. I'm doing it by choice. So who gets delivered? The people that want to be delivered. The people that go through martyrdom. The people that want to go through martyrdom. But the truth is, you don't get to make that choice at all if you don't even know you have the right to make that choice. That's why this is a level two class. You should have already learned that in our level one. But the Antichrist will be worshipped as God above God unlike any time in history. That's what he's going to do. So we know that he stops the sacrifice when he breaks his covenant, he places his image, and then he calls himself God. He, he wants to be worshipped above any other God. He calls himself God. And if you don't worship him, he is going to come to kill you. Four things. I always tell everybody, there are four main things that happen in the abomination of desolation. The Antichrist stops the sacrifice, places his image, calls himself God, and declares to be worshipped at the threat of death. That's the abomination of desolation. And there's what we call the image of the beast, which is what he puts up, and then there's the mark of the beast, which is your uh, commitment to stand and worship the Antichrist. We'll talk about that in just a second. Let's go to Daniel 12. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the three two thousand three hundred five and thirty days. But go thou thy way till the end be. For thou shalt rest and stand in the lot at the end of times. At the, at the end of days, my apologies. Now, I'm not going to go through all the time frames uh, specifically out of Daniel because there's a lot of different phrases. And you might say, well, I thought you said three and a half years, 42 months, time, time, half a time, 1260 days. But Daniel says 1290 right here. I'm not going to explain that really in depth today. You, you just Watch our daily teachings. <laughs> That's where you're going to get most of Daniel. That's why we're teaching through it very systematically. But to answer the question, Daniel adds an extra 30 days onto the prophetic clock of that three and a half years, or the angel does when he speaks to Daniel. And you might say, well, what is that for? What I believe happens in that last 30 days is the vile judgments of God poured out against the Antichrist. You will not be here for the last 30 days. The, the church is raptured at 1260. The last 30 up to 1290 is God judging the whole world. God can't judge the whole world if believers are here. God can judge parts of the world while believers are here because it's only part of the world. The believers are in the rest of the world. But when the believers are gone, God judges the whole world. That's why in the seals and in the trumpets, God judges a fourth, a third, stuff like that. Because there's still believers here. If God judged the whole world, he'd be judging also his people. But he only judges part of it because his people are still here. And then once his people are gone at the seventh trumpet, 
Then the last 30 days, it said God judges the whole world. 100% gets judged because God's people aren't even here. Just to, just to give you a quick explanation, and that's all we're going to talk about that. But what two things are mentioned about the abomination of desolation? Daily sacrifice taken away, the abomination set up. We talked about that over and over. Let's talk about 2 Thessalonians. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there coming a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now what does Paul exhort the church? Be not deceived. It's the most stressed point in Jesus' teaching. Don't be deceived. Je Paul says, Jesus is not coming back until. Don't let anybody deceive you and say, oh, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is not coming back until this happens. That's what the Bible says. A lot of people say, well, Jesus is coming back any day. No, he's coming back after this. You need to know that because the seduction and the deception of the culture will be so strong, even the very elect could fall away. Listen, let me explain to you. Falling away from Christ in the generation in which the Lord returns because of the great tribulation and taking the mark of the beast is not just the destruction of the flesh. It is the damnation of your soul. You will burn in eternal fire because of it. That's why this is so important. We pronounce the judgments of God and declare the truth of biblical end times to prepare you to stand faithful to the Lord. But what does this passage reveal about the abomination of desolation? The Antichrist will exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. Remember, he sits in the temple, calls himself God. Now, let's read the last passage and then I want to overview it for just a minute as we go to finish. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. That's the false prophet. He had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, which means he speaks like the devil. And he exercises all the power of the first beast, that's the Antichrist, before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them which dwell on the earth, by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by the sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, bond and free, to receive the mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name, here in his wisdom. Let him that understand count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six, or six six six. Who's the other beast? That's the false prophet. What is the role of the false prophet? To deceive the people, to get them to worship the Antichrist. What two aspects of the abomination of desolation are here? The image of the beast sets up in the temple and the false prophet gives it life. The mark of the beast, right hand or forehead that you may neither buy nor sell without it. Anyone that will not worship or take the mark will be breaking the law and face the consequences of death. Those who do take the mark will be under the judgments of God. Now, that's the entire lesson. I want to overview this real quick. This is the biblical storyline. The Antichrist is going to confirm a covenant. And what it means to confirm a covenant, meaning he will make a covenant of peace in the Middle East. Maybe he didn't start it, but maybe he finally did all the final touches to it to make it happen. He confirmed it. Now the world will be saying at this time, we prayed for this. We finally have peace in the Middle East because now Israel 
can have their temple and they can do their sacrifices. And now we have peace. That's what the Antichrist is going to do. When the first seal breaks, he shows himself on a white horse as a man of peace. But the second seal breaks and he rips his mask off, then he shows himself on a red horse as a beast, as a man of war. And that's what we call the abomination of desolation. Seven years is the covenant. That's how long we're going to have peace. Three and a half years in, these people are going to be coming against the Antichrist and he is going to have indignation. He is going to rage at the fact he made the covenant. Because he wants to be worshipped as God. But there obviously the Israel, Israel and the Jews are worshipping the God of Israel. Because they made this covenant. And the Antichrist will rage at it. And he will decide through military force, he's going to walk right into the temple in Jerusalem. Stop the daily sacrifice. Place his image in the temple he will sit in there as God and call himself God and declare to be worshipped at the threat of death. And if you don't worship him, he will rage and try to kill you. That's the abomination of desolation. The desolation occurs two ways. Because if you don't worship him, he's going to try to kill you. But if you worship him and you take the mark, God will kill you. You will face the judgments of God. One of those two things are going to happen. So you either remain faithful to God and you may go through martyrdom, you may be killed, or you go with the Antichrist and you will 100% be killed by God and you will be thrown in the lake of fire because of it. But there's four main things. There is the stopping of the daily sacrifice, that's the breaking of the covenant. There's the setting up of his image. And when you think of an image, uh, think of a hologram times a thousand. I mean, the technology will be so advanced at that point. It's gonna, they're gonna, it's gonna look like they can give life to things. I mean, between robotics and hologram, there's, there's no telling what this image is actually gonna be. But it's gonna breathe like it's actually alive. And then the Antichrist is gonna say, "I am God. Worship me, or I'll kill you." And when he does that, he's, it's, he's gonna say, "Take the mark," and the mark. A lot of people wonder, oh, it's, it's this tattoo or it's this microchip. Listen, it's not about uh, you know commerce in the way we think it now. The, the mark of the beast is not just about going to the grocery store and being able, ease of use, use your hand to buy groceries versus using your credit card. That's not what it's talking about. The mark of the beast is your declaration that you worship the Antichrist and you follow his leadership. That's what that's about. You can't buy or sell without it, but the buying or selling is a consequence. It's not what the mark is all about. The mark is all about your devote worship to the Antichrist. And you might say, well, how could somebody worship the Antichrist, which has his power from the devil? Well, we're going to talk about that next week, which is the harlot, which foreruns the Antichrist, which leads people down that road to Antichrist worship through her seduction and her deception. We'll talk about that next week. But the, but the abomination is very important because there is only three and a half years. The minute he does it, you can count the days, 1260 days, and Jesus is coming back. It is ordained by God. Don't be deceived. Don't let anybody tell you any. Read what the Bible says. Remember, if you can't see it with your own eyes in your own Bible, don't receive it. So if somebody says, Jesus is here, listen, Jesus will not come back. And to the abomination of desolation takes place. I keep emphasizing that over and over, but I want you to end up in the new Jerusalem. I want to see you in heaven. But we must be people of understanding so that we don't become deceived. We're going to stop here for today. I pray this lesson blessed you. If you have questions and you are a participant, please send your questions in. I do want to let you know that because we are going overseas to Brazil, that we are not going to have any physical more curriculums made. All of our curriculums are now electronic. They are on the store, so you can buy an electronic curriculum. You can download it to your phone, iPad, computer, and you can follow along with us there. But class, I love you. God bless you. Have a great day, and we will see you next week, and we'll see you tomorrow morning for our daily teachings. Have a great day.